boards, again, can't even approach uh, naming them all. She's honorary co-chair of the Democratic Socialists of America. Her most recent book is Bright Sided, How the Relentless Promotion of Positive Thinking Has Undermined America. Please join me in welcoming Barbara Ehrman. Thank you very much, Nan, for that, uh, uh, well, intriguing introduction. I, I'm not going to digress on correcting any stereotypes about Montana not at all, but um, I, I do, do want to say I'm very proud to have been invited to share today with you and get a, just a chance to learn a little bit more about what you're doing, which is very much connected to everything I am trying to do as an activist and a writer these days. I, I have never focused on homelessness per se as an issue, but it came up totally naturally when I was working on Nickel and Dime. Uh, and that's because I discovered in the, one of the first places I worked uh, the, and that I was working alongside women who were homeless. This was a restaurant, they were waitresses, full-time, workers, and they were homeless. But here's what really bothered me about their situation, is they did not consider themselves to be homeless because each of these two women who I got to know had a vehicle to sleep in. You know, and then, hey, you're not on the street, right? If you've got a van or you've got a car or something. So that was a real eye-opener. Uh, plus, the very simple reason for their homelessness, uh, which uh, has been alluded to, the cost of the first month's rent, security deposit, to get into an apartment. That is an amount of capital you're not going to earn uh, on uh, waitressing wages unless you I mail mean, in, in most of the kinds of places that uh, low-income women work. It's not possible. So you're always on the edge of homelessness one way or another. Now, was it just last week or the week before that Mitt Romney declared that he's not very concerned about these issues? He's not concerned about the poor, uh, which was not completely surprising to me somehow. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, that, I was not um, shocked by his lack of concern. That surprise came in the next sentence where Romney stated that the reason he's not concerned is that the poor are already taken care of. <laughs> They've got the government safety net. They're all right. Uh, um, everybody else might have, be, have, have problems, but the really poor, hey, you know, they've landed in a sweet spot there. <laughs> I, I think of this, I, don't, I, I need a name, better name for this, but I, I think of this as the myth of the sort of poverty payoff, that if you get poor enough, really, really poor, you're going to be taken care of. Everything's going to be all right. Government will reach out to you. Private charities will reach out to you. They'll offer you cash. They'll offer you housing subsidies and health insurance, and everything will be fine. You can just relax and cuddle up in the arms of the nanny state. You know, at that point, if you can get poor enough. It's sort of a lotus land down there um, for the very poor. So comfortable, in fact, that you'll never want to be self-supporting again once you get there. You know, in fact, that's what some of the Republican critics of Romney said when, uh, after his safety net remark is, well, why didn't he take the opportunity to talk about how the safety net turn, makes people dependent so they can never do anything for themselves again? Anyway. Um, now, I've heard that myth, not only from members of the 1%, like Mitt Romney, but from middle class people, from what working class people, blue collar people, even from poor people who think there must be some other poor people who are getting all the benefits. <laughs> and, and that's generally, you know, generally they can tell you, yeah, they don't have anything, but you know, the African Americans get it, or the immigrants get it, or somebody gets it. So that's the myth. And of course, the truth is 
that the poorer you are, Touched it. Yes. Oh, oh my God. I'm sorry. I muted myself. I don't know why. I do that all the time on my iPhone, and now I did it here. Uh, anyway, um, you know, so obviously that's not true. Things don't get easier and easier when you get poorer and poorer, right? They get rougher and rougher as you get poorer and poorer. And one reason for that is the utter inadequacy of our safety net. And I'm, I'm gonna be harsh here. Uh, unemployment in insurance, for example, covers only 40% of the unemployed. You know, because there's so many, uh, you know, every state has its laws, and if you haven't worked for a certain amount of time for one employer, you don't count. And many low-wage people, of course, have turnover in their employment history. Uh, TANF, um, our replacement for AFDC, covers only a small fraction of the people who need it. And it, it, you know, the, the painful thing about TANF is that it did not expand to meet the need as the economic downturn happened. It has been so cleverly constructed to discourage utilization. I mean, that was really one of the points of the 1996 legislation. Food stamps, good program. I mean, they, you know, Newt Gingrich wants to call food, uh, Obama the food stamp president. I'd say, you know, that's a reason to vote for the man. <laughs> you know, if he's a food stamp president, I'm with him. Because he did expand and expand that program. Uh, or, you know, as, as the um, poverty levels rose and unemployment levels rose. However, bear in mind always that the average allotment per meal uh, of food stamps is about a dollar. Now, I don't know what you can buy for a dollar that would count as a meal. A can of beans? I mean, it's really hard to figure out. And then about 30% of the poverty population has no health insurance at all. So I don't call that much of a safety net. I mean, we have something, it's not enough. And this is part of a pattern that's gone on, really, I guess, since the Reagan administration. Um, Public spending on the poor has been falling well below need for a long time. Uh, and, you know, there, it shouldn't be a surprise. You know, if you do that year after year, then you, you have the kind of uh, tattered safety net we have. But there is another more perhaps surprising reason why poverty leads to trouble and more poverty, ineluctably. And that is, um, that this is something that's, that's sort of come to fascinate me in the last three years. We seem to have a society that instead of helping the poor as its general reflexive response, uh, seems to persecute the poor. So that once you start sliding downhill, your slide is likely to accelerate till you go further and faster down to in, uh, destitution and even incarceration as an endpoint, that should be remembered. There are ways in which both government and the private sector uh, show blatant discrimination against people who are having financial trouble. There is an ever-growing number of employers who openly discriminate against unemployed people. Help wanted ads that say explicitly, no unemployed candidates will be considered at all. Think of that, that's Orwellian. If you need a job, you can't have a job. That's what that says. Now, and then when you, you go to get a job, 70% of employers now require a credit check before you get a job. Once again, if you're in financial trouble, we're not gonna hire you. You know, and this just becomes, uh, this is very targeted discrimination. Uh, if you build up 
bills, you don't pay your credit card, things on, bills on time, et cetera, and you, you build up all kinds of late fees and everything there. You may think, well, I'll get out of this through bankruptcy. That's what I'll do. You know, that's the tried and true measure, way out of this. Well, the average cost to, for, to file for bankruptcy in this country is $2,000. Where's that going to come from? We need, like, a special government program uh, to help people <laughs> become bankrupt, you know? Now, government, though, contributes its own forms of harassment uh, of the poor. The National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers estimates that upwards of 10 million, and this list was anyway by 2006, and they don't have a more recent number, 10 million people a year are charged with misdemeanors in this country. Many of them very, very minor, but still leading to fines and even jail time. Most estimates are 75% of those people charged with misdemeanors are poor or, or indigent people when they are charged. The average fines for these misdemeanors are in the range of $200 to $500. That's a lot of money. Example, uh, New York City just decided uh, not too long ago that it is illegal to put your feet up on a subway car seat. Uh, even if the car is empty except for you. It is illegal to have a bag and put it down next to you on the seat. You just got to be sitting there with that bag right, you know, on your lap. Um, people are going to and from work late at night and being arrested for these offenses. Not just warned or something like that, but arrested for the offenses. In Washington, D.C., you can now be arrested, not just warned or given a citation, for driving with an expired license. Now, that used to be something where you might get, you know, a warning, and yeah, that's a serious thing, but now it can mean handcuffs. In the last few years, uh, a growing number of cities have taken to ticketing and sometimes handcuffing children found on the streets during school hours. This city, LA, uh, pa had a, you know, I, f I think it was not that long ago that they passed the, uh, the ordinance that said that criminalized truancy. That, uh, and, uh, you know, a child found, now there's been a modification just in the last month or so to say that they can't arrest, I mean, ticket these little kids if it's only an hour into, you know, after school started. But this is a scary thing. I thought that your child might you go, you know, go out, might be passed by by the city bus that's going to take them to school because the city bus is full, and so the child is standing there. It's too late, and the child and, and the cops come over. The fine in LA is $250 to start with. In Dallas, it's $500. This is all over the country. I mean, the, this is um, this is happening. That was not a crime before truancy, but it is becoming a crime. And perversely, police harassment of poor people has actually been increasing since the economic downturn, as far as I can tell from talking to experts, criminal defense lawyers, uh, community organizers, and so on. And the reason for that is probably simply the counties and municipalities are increasingly relying on fees and fines collected basically from the poor for their revenues. You know, there's a pressure on the city or, on the city or county to make money that way. Then what happens if you can't pay your fine for one of these uh, trivial sorts of misdemeanors? Well, there's a very good chance you'll go to jail. There's a case uh, that caught my eye of a South Carolina woman uh, in last, uh, I guess it was in December, uh, who had become impoverished in the recession. She lost her business and was um, supporting herself by selling her own plasma and collecting scrap metal and selling it. She was collecting the scrap metal in her yard. So she got um, charged with having a, quote, messy yard, 
which is another misdemeanor, and she was fined $480. She didn't have it, of course, so she couldn't pay it. She was jailed for six days. I mean, that's just the sort of thing that happens. I, as far as I know, she was not charged room and board for her jail time. <laughs> Although that is something that more and more counties are doing or contemplating. Right here in California, counties like Riverside, I say, what? They're going to live in luxury in our jail? No, they're going to pay for it, you know? Anyway, even reaching out for government help can potentially get you into trouble with the law. If you apply for food stamps or TANF in most places, you will be checked by computer to see whether there are any outstanding warrants for your arrest. I interviewed a homeless man in Washington, D.C., who had been arrested for having an outstanding warrant when he was inside a D.C. homeless shelter. He was staying in the homeless shelter. In the night, the police came in to do, well, turn on the lights, do a big warrant search, and he was, he was arrested and taken out. His prior crime, for which he had the warrant, was that he had been homeless. He had been sleeping on a sidewalk or standing too long on a sidewalk in front of somebody's store. Uh, and so here's a homeless man inside a home, so homeless shelter who's arrested for being homeless and then, of course, taken to jail. Uh, I don't call that a, um, an effective response uh, to a crisis. Now, it's very easy to get an outstanding warrant. If you miss, and this could, I mean, this applies to even, you know, people like us who can eat in such delightful surroundings as the Biltmore here. But if you miss a court summons for an unpaid traffic ticket or a private sector debt, and you get a court summons, a warrant can be issued for your arrest. Now, why did you miss that court summons? Well, possibly you changed your address. Possibly you had no address. Possibly they sent it, especially if it was a collection agency, to the wrong address, knowing that when they've got you up against the wall and say, next step is jail, people will do anything to pay if they possibly can. Now, suppose you sink all the way down to homelessness, um, living actually on the streets. Next thing you discover is that it's virtually illegal to be homeless in this country. At least you're likely to find, and you know this, I'm not telling you anything new, that m most of the biological necessities of daily life, like sleeping, sitting, uh, lying down, are illegal if you look like you might be homeless. A there was a report issued uh, last year by the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty and they recount the following story uh, from Wenatchee, Washington. And I'm, I'm quoting the story of a family. Uh, toward the end of 2010, a family of two parents and three children that had been homeless for a year and a half applied for a two-bedroom apartment. The day before a scheduled meeting uh, during the, um, you know, for the final stages of the lease, the father of the family was arrested for public urination. The arrest occurred when there were no public restrooms available for use. Due to the arrest, the father was um, unable to make the appointment with the apartment manager and they lost the apartment. They lost the access to the property. Uh, as of um, this year, 20, I mean as of 2011, they were still homeless and searching for housing. Such a small thing, not having a place to pee. But, you know, that can, get, that's, can, that can be big trouble. And this is something that was very interesting to me, that the Occupy movement was discovering in the fall. You know, here you had all kinds of people, well, many of them actually homeless, but also uh, people who were not homeless, but, you know, a lot of college graduates with heavy debts and everything. And they, they undertook, really, to live outdoors with the chronically homeless, and like the chronically homeless. And what you discover there very quickly, and they discovered, 
uh, is that you are in trouble from the moment you do that. Uh, and I think, you know, actually a lot of homeless people came to the sites of Occupy and joined them because it was a little bit safer to be in an Occupy uh, site. You were less likely to be dragged off uh, by the police and uh, or jailed or beaten or whatever. Um, so it's, it, you know, there are so many things you cannot do outdoors if you look like you're homeless. Uh, the laws vary from city to city, but one of the most interesting being a law in Sarasota, Florida, uh, which has an ordinance that makes it illegal to, quote, engage in digging or earthbreaking activities, quote, close quote, e.g. to build a latrine, to build a fire, to cook, and those are all illegal. And it's also illegal to be asleep, and get this, and, quote, when awakened, state that he or she has no other place to sleep. Now think about that. It is illegal to sleep outdoors if you don't have another place to sleep. <laughs> it may be all right, I guess, if you have a, you know, a, a six-bedroom home, but you can't just be sleeping there because you're homeless. So it is illegal in many ways to be homeless or to live outdoors for any other reason. Uh, it should be noted, though, that, of course, there are no laws requiring cities or counties to provide food, shelter, or restrooms for their indigent citizens. The crackdown on the homeless probably began in the 80s. Uh, you could go further back, I'm sure. Uh, but that was when we had the big and still ongoing experiment in broken windows policing in, in cities. You know, the idea, the theory being any the smallest infraction must be punished, and that way people will, you know, not get around to doing homicides and other things they might be contemplating, you know, if you catch them when they're just loitering, et cetera. No one has tallied um, all the suffering occasioned by this crackdown on the homeless uh, since, the, since the 80s. And I think it should be done. It's a project I'd like to see. But I don't know how you do it, but there would be there's so many deaths from exposure and cold I um, will just give you an, a sample story from, uh, again, from the National uh, Law Center's um, Criminalizing Crisis Report, and I'm quoting. Um, this is about a homeless pregnant woman in Columbia, South Carolina. During daytime hours, she could not be inside a shelter, right? So many shelters, you've got to get out first thing in the morning. So um, she attempted to spend time in a museum perfectly sensible, you know, thing to do, but was told she could not stay there because she, well, she looked indigent, you know. Uh, in uh, several um, other instances, still during her pregnancy, the woman was told that she could not sit in a local park during the day because that would constitute, quote, squatting. In early 2011, about six months into her pregnancy, this homeless woman began to feel unwell, went to a hospital, and delivered a stillborn child. And she was just harried to, you know, to the point of the death of her uh, a child. In some places in this country, and in some cities, such as Orlando, it is even illegal to help the poor. There are laws forbidding the sharing of food with people who look indigent in public places. Um, you, you, we could share food amongst ourselves here, but if we went outdoors and we're not that far from Skid Row uh, and tried to share some of our food, um, it, it might attract a little police attention. I don't think it's against the law in Los Angeles, but it would be certainly seen as a dubious activity. So we have a pattern here in this country of, of defunding services that might help the poor while ramping up law enforcement uh, for very minor offenses. And we starve school and public transportation budgets, like for city buses, then make truancy illegal. Shut down public housing, and then make it a crime to be homeless. And at a time of high unemployment, make it especially difficult for those who are having money problems to get a job. There isn't a safety net 
There's no ladder climbing out of poverty. There is what amounts um, to a greased chute. Once you start falling, you go faster and faster down. Uh, I can imagine, and I know you can imagine because I've been listening to you some this morning, you know, what a genuine safety net would look like, what it might include, you know, all the, the kinds of quick responses to people who lose their housing, the need for long-term affordable housing, the need for jobs that pay enough so that you can actually live on, live on them and then live on in them indoors. We need that. That would be a reform. Health care for all. I mean, we could, make, we could make a list, a big wish list of all the things that should happen. But I think in a very urgent short-term sense, the challenge is could we stop the meanness the relentless persecution of people who are already having a hard time. I don't think this is a political issue. I don't think this is a left versus right issue. I can't see why the Tea Party wouldn't get behind this issue, given their feelings about government. I think it's a moral issue, purely a moral issue. Because, you know, <clears throat> we've just got to stop kicking people when they're already down and move toward reaching out a hand. Thank you. <laughs>